Hey YouTube, how you doing? Thanks for stopping by. This is Matthew with the Counselor's Guild. Today we'll be doing a book review on Freud and Beyond. A history of modern psychoanalytic thought. Okay. I'll start with the authors. Uh, authors are um, Stephen A. Mitchell, PhD, uh, lived uh, from 1946 to 2000, died of a heart attack in 2000, but it did a lot in his 54 years. He was a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst, considered the founder, I'm sorry, considered to be the founder and leader of relational psychoanalysis, established the International Psychoanalytic Journal, and he was instrumental in developing the APA, uh, the relational track for them. Um, and you got Margaret, ba Margaret Black, J. Black, LCSW, She's a founding board member of the Stephen Mitchell Center for Relational Studies. She's the wife of Stephen Mitchell, and she's been uh, continuing his work uh, through his, his center, and but also his, his writing, so thank you for this. Book characteristics, uh, you're looking at 232 pages. That's eight chapters, um, published back in 1995, and then uh, it's re-released in 2016, and published by Basic Books. Now, 232 pages does not seem like a lot, but it's there. It is it's a lot. This book is very dense. Um, there is a lot of information in here, um, and it takes a lot longer to read than you think. Okay, um, so that for that reason, I give it my white dwarf award. Uh, it's just so much stuff packed into here. Um, that it took me a lot longer to read um, than most books, I'd say. Chapter one, they start with Freud. Of course, they kind of have to. And uh, that's what's great about the book. It starts with Freud and then it grows out. Um, and it, every, you know, for each person it grows out to, like they talk about a new person, it resorts back to Freud, what he thought, what his ideas were, and then you know compares the two. So I really like that part. That was my I say the best part of the book is how they they uh, they do that. So um, let's start. So Sigmund Freud. Uh, it starts from you know when he got into hypnosis and then he turned into psycho turned it into psychoanalysis. He's, you know, bringing the unconscious to conscious. They have to be conscious. They can't be under this hypnotic trance. Uh, uh, but also they um, you know they go over the not topographic. Topography, topo topographic model, uh, free association, transference, resistance, dreams, childhood sexuality, the theory of instinctual drives, the Oedipus complex, id, ego, and superego. They talk about all that stuff, and they do it so well. It's it's almost like layman's terms that the way they do it. So if you're wanting more information on Freud and his theory and all of his different concepts, this book might be for you. It does a very good job at doing at, at making this stuff understandable. <laughs> All right, uh, so I did. I put an example uh, down at the bottom. I don't know if my my picture is blocking it, but this was written in the book. This is from Stephen uh, Mitchell. It says here uh, the resistance to particular free association. So it talks about transference and resistance. That's why I bolded it there. Uh, the resistance to particular free associations is the very same force, Freud began to speculate, that drove the original memories out of consciousness in the first place. It is precisely this transference and this resistance that needs to be exposed, identified, and dissolved. By analyzing the patient's free associations and resistances to free, as to free associations, Freud believed he could gain access to both sides of the pathogenic conflict. Number one, the secret feelings and memories, and number two, the defenses. The thoughts and feelings rejecting those secrets, feelings, and memories. So it gives you an explanation of why he developed transferences and resistance. Where that came from. You know, he's doing free associations and he ran into this problem with these resistances. Like, this is, I need to focus on this. This is part of it, you know. Uh, so he brought that in and made it part of his theory. Very good, very good with Sigmund Freud. I, I, if you want to learn more about him, get this book. You, you will not, I think, regret it. Uh, I think it's, um, 
If you have a hard time understanding Freud, this would be a good book for you. Which I <laughs> I do. I, I have a hard time with Freud sometimes, so uh, I was very happy reading this book. Uh, the next up, next chapter, they talk about ego psychology. Of course, uh, Anna Freud, uh, his daughter, you know, her ego, dis, you know, all of her ego defenses, uh, the compromise between impulse and defenses. Um, this is where they start to talk about development, ego psychology. They're, they're interested in how the ego develops. Um, Heinz Hartman, they talked a, a, a lot about him and Spitz um, and how they looked at the environment and how that you know, affects the development of personality. Uh, Spitz had a lot of different ideas, object relations, identification. Um, let's see, Margaret Mayer. Uh, she worked with psychosis, and again, this book goes into their history of each one of these people. Uh, that's why I said it's dense. I mean, it talks a lot about you know what these people are working with, and how they applied for a theory, and what who who they worked with, and how they developed their own understanding. I think of what Freud was trying to say, uh, or was tr what Freud was trying to do. Uh, and Edith. It looks like Jacobson to me, but I think it's Jacobson. Isn't that the the, uh, I don't know, Jacobson, Edith Jacobson, <laughs> early experience to determine drives and how we feel about ourselves and others. Okay, ego psychoanalysis. So the, I bought, I put this down here. Stephen A. Mitchell, and this is this. Uh, I just want to put it as an example of, you know, the good things about this book. Uh, he talked about how ego psychologists were different from Freud. One way they're different is ego psycho psychoanalysis. Um, they encourage their patients to enter into what would eventually be called a working alliance, and what we do now, a therapeutic alliance, right? Uh, and it says here, operating as an effective scout, the patient developed her abilities to better observe herself. And it seems like with Freud, it was more like, it was more one-sided, you know? We want to work ourselves on the job. Freud was like, I have my interpretations, you know, and you have to go with them, you know? Um, so, this is where I think a lot of uh, a lot of things you see nowadays you know, with the uh, ego psychology. They want the patient to be reflective rather than reactive to delay gratifying herself in favor of describing what she needed to work towards, anticipating consequences rather than leaping into action. Okay. So that was ego psychology. That was chapter two. That was just chapter two. And, and you know, they, they fit all this stuff in one chapter. Um, and there's eight chapters, so they're long chapters. And there's a lot of information in each one of those. So uh, go slow. Uh, I had to go back numerous times just because I forgot maybe what one person was working on. And then they talk about that person. I'm like, what does that person do? And I had to go back. So um, it's it's difficult. Next up, interpersonal psychoanal psychoanalysis. Uh, this chapter mainly talked about Harry Stack Sullivan. I think he took most of the chapter... Uh, he was a psychiatrist, and he worked with schizophrenia. He was really interested in how uh, people interacted. He thought personality developed from interactions with others, and of course it does. But it's not the whole, I mean, not the only thing, right? Um, you know, where we were raised, what environment we were in, that had a um, has an impact. But also Freud, you know, he's more he had a lot of like nature. Uh, if he was like the nature versus nurture, where it was like really in the nature, you know, with the it impulses and the instinctual drives, things like that. Um, so Harry was inter interested in interpersonal uh, interactions, um, inquired about interactions from the past when, to understand the patient's presence. He has a self-system, uh, and they talk a, a, a lot about that uh, in that in that chapter, which is, you know, it, it's, it's great. And it describes how, you know... Um, how Freud saw interactions, I think. I can't remember now. But but they, they do bring Freud in and they, they compare the two. And I, I think that's that's something that you know I really liked. I really enjoyed reading uh, how those two and, and the difference and how it's growing. Uh, Eric Fromm. Uh, human beings develop different character types at various points in history. Different types of societies require particular types of people to perform specific Socio-economic functions. 
There's tremendous pressure for all people to shape themselves according to social need. Okay. Again, interactions. And Clara Thompson, more present focus. Analyst is seen as a full participant in interpersonal patterns they create and maintain together with the, with the client. Um, so all these three, there's more too. I think there's maybe three or four more interpersonal psychoanalysts, but I think these three are the main focus. Harry Sullivan, especially. Melanie Klein had her own chapter, and it was the hardest for me to grasp and read. Um, I actually had to take a break, I think, reading her chapter. It's getting too... Um, it wasn't enjoyable, you know, to read. Uh, for me, for, for me personally. Uh, and I just put, like, you know, uh, some, of the, some of the work that she did... Uh, it says here, Klein's work towards validating and extending Freud's hypothesis through direct observation clinical work with children. Okay. And her theory, I mean, this is all from the book. This is all Stephen Mitchell's writing here on the slide. Um, it says Klein's account of earlier early experience conjures up images, um, um, up an image of discontinuous ego. I'm not sure what that means, discontinuous ego. Uh, facilitating, which is what, like back and forth. Uh, between a loving orientation towards a loving and lovable other person, other people, and a hateful orientation towards hating and hateful other people. The emotional equanimity in this earliest organization of experience depends on the child's ability to keep these two worlds, worlds separate. For the good breast to be a safe refuge, it must be clearly distinguishable from the malevolence of the bad breast. Like I'm, I'm trying to figure this out here. Like that kind of helped. Like, um, what was the uh, the cloth and the wire monkey test? You know, uh, like is it something like that? Like, like good? Like the nurturing? Uh, I, I just, I, it lost me. It was really hard. Uh, she came up with the paranoid schizoid position. Paranoid refers to the central persecutory <laughs> anxiety. Uh, the fear of invasive malevolence, some tough words, <laughs> coming from the outside. Uh, schizoid refers to the central defense splitting between good and bad worlds. Okay, So good and bad breast, that's something we develop early on. We know what's good, what's bad. Uh, the world is anxiety-filled, so we have to determine what's good and what's bad and to stick with what's good. Is that what she's saying? That's what I think. Um, <laughs> Clinian analysis, anal, analysts use all the same terms to describe the analytic situation. This is so. This does this in, in every chapter. It talks about the different analytic situation. What do they do differently in the office? But the basic sense of what's going on is quite different. The patient and the analyst are much more fundamentally enmeshed than in Freud's view. It is not as if the patient is simply revealing the contents of her own mind to generally to a gen, generally neutral observer. The patient experiences the analytic situation in terms of her primitive object relations. At times, the analyst is a good breast, magically transformative. Interpretations are good milk, protective, nurturing, and restorative. At times, the analyst is a bad breast, deadly and destructive. Interpretations are poisonous, destroying from within if ingested. Like, <laughs> I, I don't, okay. All right, I get it. Like, there's bad bad things and good things. You know, I don't, I just, it was really hard. Uh, on this chapter, I had really a lot of difficulty with it. And I'm not trying to be, you know, like, I'm trying to think abstract. Good breast, bad breast. I know they're not talking about, it probably starts out that way, right? But I'm trying to picture, you know, I know that she worked with kids, but developmentally, like, where does that go, you know, as they grow up and get away from, uh, you know, um, having to be breastfed, you know. Um, I think it's just her looking for early experiences and how that affects uh, child development. So, uh, moving on. But that, that, that's a tough chapter. And I didn't know much about Melanie Klein. I think I've heard of her, but it's not something I'm taught I remember learning about in undergrad or grad school. So, so moving on. 
object relations school. This was um, they talked mainly. They like I thought they talked mainly about Bobby, uh, but no, there was they 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 talked a little bit about him, but they talked mainly about uh, W R D Fairbarn Fair Baron. I wish they didn't put that I in there. It'd make it a lot easier to pronounce. Uh, and then W D Winnicott. So both these guys obviously um, want to be fancy with their names and. And uh, want to use their initial, but that's fine. That's cool. <laughs> uh, uh, Fairbairn, uh, he looked at healthy parenting resulted in a child with an outward orientation directed towards real people, um, who would provide real contact and exchange. The child in Fairbairn's system becomes like an unresponsive features of the parents. I thought this was interesting. This is why I put it. This is all written. This is all from um, Mitchell's book. Okay. Um, so the child becomes like the unresponsive features of the parents, depressed, isolated, masochistic, bullying, and so on. It is through the absorption of these uh, pathological character traits that he feels connected to the parent who is unavailable in other times. So if I'm, if I'm going to connect to the parent, I'm going to connect to him somehow. Either it's going to be good features or bad features. Uh, I'm going to become the parent, whether it's good or bad. It is not unconscious pleasure-seeking that imprisons the analyst in neurosis. The neurosis embodies the only forms of relation with others and analyzed believes in. She feels connected to others, both in the real world and in the presence of her, of her inner world, only through painful states of mind and self-defeating patterns of behavior. So yeah, you know, blame the parents. <laughs> uh, but I think there's some truth to that. You know, when I read all these different theories and ideas, I was like, yeah, I can see I can see that, you know. Is it the only way we develop? No, I think, you know, growing up, for, uh, if you are growing up in isolation um, or depressed parent who is maybe more angry, you may take on that kind of trait. You may take on that type of reaction um, um, from the parent. Is it the only thing? I don't think so. Some people swing the other way. I grew up, well, not me, but just for example, uh, a parent that, that's very angry and abusive. Well, I'm going to be not that. I'm going to be the complete opposite of that. Um, which could lead to, you know, um, neglect or um, they call it laissez-faire parenting, which is like a very laid back, which is not good either. But anyway, um, that's W.R.D. Fairbarn uh, and D.W. Winnicott. Uh, the bridge Winnicott constructed between the quality and nuances of adult subjectivity and the subtleties of mother-infant interactions provide a powerful new perspective for viewing both the development of the self and the analytic process. Winnicott saw the quality of the infant's experiences in the earliest months of life as crucial for the emergence of pers personhood. Of course, I, and that, that, that was a good idea. You know, that's, Right, on. I think yeah, early experiences are important. If it was the environment that the mother provided that determined the outcome, so all these people they're trying to figure out, they're trying to figure out how people become people. You know, we're you know how did the personality develop? And they all looked at parenting. A lot of them looked at parenting. A lot of them looked at interactions. A lot of them looked at environment. And they're all it's all going to come together, and and it's going to be all of them. I think that's what we look at now in the present. It's all these different things that come together. All right, moving on. Psychology is identity and self. Eric Erickson, of course. Uh, for Erickson, the baby's experiences of subsequent identity are shaped through child-rearing practices that reflect the values and needs of the culture in which the child is born. He had the psychosocial stages of development. If you want to know more about the stages of development, um, I did a video on it, um, so check that out. So Erickson, of course, they did a uh, comparison between Erickson and Freud. You know, he has the social, so, psychosexual stages, Freud has. And Erickson has the psychosocial stages. Okay. And it, 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 it did a really good job of just, I, you know, the difference between the two. Okay. And if Heinz Kohut, self-psychology, I mean, he wrote a whole book on that, so... If you're interested in self psychology, they have they have a lot of information in the book in this book. Um, but also, if you're interested, check his own 
uh, get his own book on self psychology. Uh, he tried to put himself in his patient's shoes to understand the experience of the patient's point of view. This approach, which he described as emphatic immersion and vicarious inter introspection, became for him the defining feature of psychoanalytic methodology. You know, and of course, that's something that we do today. You know, empathy, putting ourselves in our, you know, well, not both of our feet, one of the, one foot in our patient's, you know, shoes, and the other foot kind of on, you know, stable, stable ground. Um, so, um, but those are uh, psychologies of identity and self. They both worked on how identity, how how people develop an identity and sense of self. And then they, they go into contemporary Freudian revisionist, Otto, Otto Kernberg, uh, developmental model. Um, and there's a lot on Otto Kernberg, uh, but I just put kind of like this um, one thing they talk about, developmental model, and how, how you have to have three developmental tasks, what is self and what is others. You got to do that. Um, you got to overcome the splitting of good and bad selves, which reminds me of the Melanie Klein and then number three is Freudian neurotic conflict between impulse and defenses. That's number three. So yeah, get all get through all those um, in your life. So um, let's see, Roy Schaefer. Roy Schaefer is looking at me, and I don't know. <laughs> the picture is uh, disturbing me. <laughs> Roy Schaefer. Uh, he, he, you know, you have to develop, the, uh, develop your own sense of agency. He also started narrative therapy, um, the basic transformation of what takes place in the analytic process, the patient's gradual assumption of agency, and res with respect to previously disclaimed action. So if you want to learn, to learn more about agency, there's a big, big part in the chapter on that. Uh, Hans Lowald, mental health is contingent on the richness of experience that is generated by open channels between primary processes, language, the last two, they, they really focus on language, and secondary processes, primitive and sophisticated thinking, lower and higher forms of intellectual organization. And Jane, I'm sorry, Jacques Lacan. Lacan believed that the determinative dimension in human experience is neither self nor relations with others, but language. Okay. Language is important. I mean, it's, it's all these things. All these things, you know, development, interpersonal, um, child rearing, you know, language, all these things come together. Um, there's not, it's not just one, it has to be all, I think. Controversies in theory. In theory. So the, the last two chapters, they don't talk about any, any, well, they do, but they mainly focus on uh, uh, not, not therapy, non psychoanalysts. First up, trauma versus fantasy. What is the cause of psychopathology? It looks at na nature versus nurture. Nature and nurture are now generally regarded as less distinct, separable causes, and more as interactive, mutually created set of processes. So I think what it's giving you is what they believe now uh, than what they believed before. You know, as you can see, Freud was more on the nature side, and then the ego psychology was more nurture. Um, and Freud even went back and forth, and it talks about that in a book, and how he ha he was for nurture, and then he went nature, and then he's, I think he went back to nurture, but or or he used both of them. Um, Post Freudian psychoanalyst proposes a less definitive account of nature. Uh, the the inference experiences are understood as powerfully impacted upon the very beginning by the rims va values and personality of the caregivers, views of nature and our nature are presumed to reflect themselves the social and historical context in which we live so maybe not uh, conflict versus uh, arrested development what impedes healing the arrested development model is often presented in concert with an understanding of defensive processes centered on disassociation rather than on, rep on repression instead of hor instead of a horizontal split between consciousness and buried impulses Developmental theorists envision a mind rent with vertical splits between different self states that have not taken have not been integrated with one another. Okay. That's another controversy: uh, gender and sexuality. Um, they they mention like pre-edipal uh, 
conflicts that led to homosexuality. I think, of course, they changed her mind and all that. Um, I can't remember uh, what exactly they talked about. I know they talked about the, the homosexuality uh, and how they thought it was from the pre-Oedipal pre conflicts. Empiricism versus hermeneutics. This is the first time I've ever heard of hermeneutics. Nudics? Hermeneutics? <laughs> Empiricism, uh, you know, is the knowledge of the choir through the senses and experiences, right? Hermeneutics is knowledge is derived from interpretation. So they kind of divide, uh, they, they compared psychoanalysis, uh, psychoanalytic theory, um, to history um, and how the two are, are more similar. You know, how some people might say psychology is not a science. Um, um, but if you look at like history, if you look at, uh, um, I mean, heck, even I think I, you know I heard a better comparison. If you compare psychology to astronomy, um, they're very similar. I, gosh, I wish I remember where I heard that from. But if you look at the two, they're they're very similar as far as interpretation. I mean, we, you you can look at Mars, but you can't. Well, I guess you could study it. Well, we have we have probes there now. So you can look at Neptune. Or you can look at a galaxy, you know, billions of star star uh, light years away, um, and make inferences about it. Um, but I don't know. I I'd have to look that up. That's something I'd want to probably do on a on a different video. Um, but anyway, moving on. Controversies in technique. They talk about past and present, interpretation versus relationship. Um, I think reading the, the relationship, what's more, it's, what's more important, the interpretation or the relationship? And I think um, they, they started to, to look at it's important to have a good therapeutic relationship. Um, transformation, the analytic relationship, counter-transference. So the controversies, I wasn't really a big fan of that chapter. I didn't really read much about it um, or at least uh, take a lot of notes on it to do the video. Um, so I didn't think much of it was important. Overall opinion, uh, the book does very well at presenting for his work, as well as all the other psychoanalysts that came after. It's easy to understand, uh, for me, reading this book was easier than reading Freud's stuff. Um, I like how the book kept going back to Freud's view when discussing another analysis. I like the comparative um, between old and new, between different ideas, um, and it does a really good job at doing that. Uh, it's definitely not for a beginner. If you if you are an undergrad and you just completed, I don't know, your Psych 101 course or, heck, even even got your bachelor's degree, I don't know if this book would be for you. I don't know if you'd get much out of it. You might just say this book is really boring. Um, but if you are, I mean, if you really into Freud stuff, psychoanalyst, uh, and you want to be a, a future analyst, probably something you want to look into. It's not... It's not a fun read. Like it's, you know, I don't know if you're gonna get much enjoyment as you would get educational value out of it. It's more like a textbook. Um, uh, it's not for beginning. You will struggle with staying awake. I know I did. Um, it's, it's, it's a good, it's a good book to put you to sleep. And I don't, and I don't mean that. And in, in, in like, I'm not trying to make fun of it or say, but you know, sound bad. Um, it's you know not the writer's fault. It's just material. It's it's Freud and history mixed together, and it's not like World War II history. It's more like uh, I don't know. Um, it's not exciting history. Um, you will need to reread. Okay, you will go back. You have to reread. Um, it's it's just helpful, but also you may they may be talking about something. You're like, what was? I forgot what that was about. Oh, I gotta reread it. You might have to go back. If you want to learn more about psychoanalysis, theories, analysts, uh, the concepts, the history, this this would help. Okay, so I, I thought it was good for those those reasons. It's not something you're going to enjoy reading, um, but you just do it anyway because you're just you're you're more interested in learning the the concepts and things. So the history. So wow, I think that's it. Yeah. So I'm really glad to put this book behind me. Uh, I'm not a big psychoanalyst, um, a big reader of Freud, um, so it was very difficult for me, but I'm really glad to put it behind me. It is a good book. I would go get it if you're interested in Freud. 
his history and psychoanalysts in general, uh, I would I would read it. I think it would help um, uh, help you. So that's all I got. I think that's uh, I'm gonna end it there. Please like, subscribe. Um, I'm gonna try to be putting out more videos this year. I didn't do a whole lot last year, and I um, definitely want to do more this year and continue growing. Um, on this video, I think I have 10 subscribers, so uh, I want to hit 20 <laughs> by the end of the year. Um, it's kind of double, you know, what I did this the first year. So please subscribe uh, and uh, you know send me a comment if you understand Melanie Klein better than I do. Uh, please help me out with that. Um, I'd appreciate it. So you have a good night. Thank you.